Welcome to Follow to Lead, where we discover how to listen for and follow God's call so that we might lead others to God. Our shared stories of inspiration from religious leaders and those active in the educational ministry of the church can help you know better how God is calling you and the role passionate Catholic education plays in spreading His message of faith, hope, and love. Now please welcome the hosts of Follow to Lead, Father Randy Sly and Kyle Pietrantonio. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ the teacher, teach us to listen. Teach us to do the deep listening to the sounds of our soul, waiting to hear your voice calling us to cast down deeper, to become fishers of men and women, shepherds of souls, to follow your will in order to lead others to the truth, beauty, and goodness only you can offer. Amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome to Follow to Lead, a journey twice a month into the world of Catholic education, exploring what it means to follow God in order to lead others to Him. I'm Father Randy Sly, your co-host. And I'm Kyle Petrantonio. Uh, today we will be talking with Dr. Claire Kilbane, professor of the practice at the University of Notre Dame, affiliated with the McGrath Institute for Church Life. Claire began her career as a teacher at St. James the Less Elementary School in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, prior to joining the McGrath Institute a little more than two years ago, Claire spent 20 years as a professor of education at four different universities. She's authored many books and articles, uh, as well as multimedia material. Claire has a degree in elementary education from the University of Dayton, a master's degree in instructional design and technology from the Ohio State University, and a PhD in educational evaluation from the University of Virginia. Uh, Claire, welcome to Follow to Lead. Thanks so much for inviting me to join your podcast. Well, Claire, we're really glad that you could be with us today. And as we begin our time together, I'm not sure that uh, all of our listeners or viewers really know what the McGrath Institute is all about. Could you tell us about the Institute and what you do for the church? Sure. So the McGrath Institute was um, set up by Father Hesburgh in the 1970s to serve as a bridge to channel resources in the University of Notre Dame to the leadership in the church and to help build up the church and assist its mission of evangelizing the world. Um, we collect together many different programs including things like the Center for Liturgy, which actually pre-existed the Institute for Church Life, but later was folded into it. It actually was founded in the um, earlier part of the 20th century. Um, and we combine many different um, programs that address the needs of Catholic schools, including our Religion and Science Initiative and our Office of Life and Human Dignity that works with teachers. Um, we offer online theology courses um, for different ministers in the church and we convene and offer programming on campus to bring together different groups in the church to help them partner and to work with us as well to address some of the challenges of the 21st century church. Now is the STEP program, is that the theology online program? Yes, the STEP program has actually been offering courses for so long that the name was originally set up to stand for Satellite Theological Education Programming. Um, and it's been in existence for over 20 years now. We have about 5,000 enrollments per year and work with uh, members of the church all over the world to help them continue their education. Claire, I'm an alum, proud alum of the Notre Dame ACE program, um, which I know you're familiar with and a number of our listeners are familiar with that program. How does McGrath Institute interface or liaise with um, the Institute of Educational Initiatives under which ACE falls at Notre Dame? Is there some collaboration there? Can you speak to that a bit? So we complement each other. Uh, we're both institutes, so we are organizations within the university yep. that collaborate both within the university and also are ordered toward collaborating outside. We have different missions. So the Institute for Educational Initiative primarily focuses on education. The Institute for Church Life focuses primarily on the various needs of the church, some of which include education. And there are obviously other, you know, other needs that the church has. Um, we work with many different constituents within the church, including the church hierarchy, 
um, as well as parishes and dioceses and schools. Um, so the area where we would overlap would be in the area of Catholic education. As we were preparing for the podcast, I was intrigued by a comment that you made to me in an email. And, and you said, at my core, I'm a designer more than a professor or a teacher or anything else. I'd like you to go into some detail. What, and I know this is a part of your role at, uh, at McGrath is, is being a learning designer. What, what does that uh, look like to you? Sure. So I guess I would just preface it to say that one of the advantages of being mid-career is that you've had enough past experiences to have gone through professional kind of finding of yourself. Um, and so if anyone's listening and is, is still in that process, I encourage you to keep moving through because if you're blessed as I was, the Lord will show you um, more of what you were created to be. And you might actually be moving through different stages. You know, at first I was a teacher and then I was a professor and then I realized that all along I had been a designer. And so I guess the question was, what is a designer? And I'll give you a short answer, which is, I think a designer is a creative person whose expression of that creativity is applied in a practical setting so that their art is not only beautiful, but also functional. And by functional, I mean that it's ordered toward a particular goal. Um, and one of the beautiful things about being Catholic is your worldview helps you understand that this thing, this design actually has a telos. And that's very compatible with my worldview. Um, I think that's one of the reasons I've probably gravitated toward design in my life um, and my work. And now I discover that there's all kinds of things that you can design for, uh, but you have to understand many different aspects of the practical um, realities that you're working with. So a designer has to know things and be able to learn from experience as they're trying to address problems with better design. Yeah, I was intrigued by that. When I, I did some PhD work at K-State in uh, College of Education and Instructional Design. And uh, so I kind of am getting what you're, what you're going for here, because it is an opportunity to take and, and kind of bring some new perspective to the, the learning experience uh, sure. for those that are uh, going through it. Sure. Traditional teaching is very relational. Um, which it should be because there's a personal connection between a teacher and the students and that becomes very formative. And so the field of education very much comes from that relational orientation. The field of instructional design actually emerged from the very real needs of the military industrial complex that uh, was involved in World War I and II. And so there was a, a, an emergence at, in science and psychology at that time. And those, those uh, resources of science were brought to the enterprise of educating people. And so instructional design grew up with this orientation of efficiency and effectiveness, um, but without that relational aspect. So an instructional designer is often responsible for preparing materials and programming that will support people they don't actually know or have a relationship with. And that usually has high stakes. So as a result, they have to think very differently about getting to know the challenges of whatever they're designing, as well as getting to know the needs of the people who will participate in what is ever, whatever is designed. And so they apply some very strategic um, and systematic approaches that are beginning to filter their way into education. Um, things like needs assessments, and the emphasis on the assessment cycle very much reflects this kind of scientific orientation that is making its way into the enterprise of teaching and learning. Um, so I, I guess I would just kind of say it's unusual for a person to have a degree in education and also have a degree in instructional design. I never knew about the field, um, but when I was a new teacher working in Catholic school, I made it to February and was still smiling. And because <laughs> of that, my principal decided I needed more responsibility. And she put me in charge of the school's technology committee. And in that role, the very first thing I had to do was create a committee because there wasn't one. And I realized I was in over my head. And so I thought, gosh, where have I gone before? Where are all the answers? I'll go to seek my master's degree and figure out what guidance college professors have to share with me. And I picked up the phone, called 
the office at Ohio State and was lucky enough to be transferred to a professor that was actually at their desk and answered their phone. And he talked me into participating in the instructional design program. Um, and it was a great blessing to have had that wonderful God incidence of having those things align because it took me on a, on a path that's really been unique to my professional career where I've been able to bring in some of these wonderful assets from the field of instructional design that would never make their way into the teaching and learning enterprise, which are actually way more important now in the classroom because there's so many different choices that mm -hmm. teachers now can make. And there's so much more need to recognize the differences of their students and how to strategically address those needs um, with the various materials and resources they have available. That's great, Claire. I could see ACE being very interested in leveraging your expertise um, in their <laughs> programs. Um, now you and your family currently live in South Bend. Uh, incidentally, I just flew back from Northern Indiana last night um, after touring a number of schools in that part of our country, beautiful part of, of the country and um, a great college town and salt of the earth people. Uh, um, uh, is that where you're from originally, Claire? Or I know you've moved around in, with some of your, your graduate school work. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Sure. So I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. And actually, um, while I did travel, uh, moved around a little bit, I, I spent the last uh, 20 years there. And I grew up in a suburb there, um, the fourth of eight children. And attended St. Agatha School, which is a wonderful parish school. Um, my childhood was pretty idyllic. It was really a bouncing between the wonderful society, my family, um, and then also the, uh, the, the local school. I was even able to walk home for lunch. Um, being right in the middle of the family, it was wonderful to be known and to have that really tight community. And I think that um, my sense of the importance of the relationship between a family and a school and the wonderful warm kind of, I don't know, tapestry of care it weaves around children um, really informs a lot of what I strive to support schools in being able to design. Because I think what I recognize as the parent of a Catholic school student, and she happens to be an only child, which is was quite a surprise to my husband, who's the youngest of seven children and I, um, to have an only child, we recognize that the experience I had um, has so much benefit to it, but it's so unusual in the modern era. And we can reconstruct and redesign those kinds of warm tapestries of care around students and families if we try to do that and if we know how to do that. So I guess, you know, asking about my upbringing is, is fun because it really informs a lot of what I strive to help schools create for their, for their students. Now, <clears throat> you have a, you've had a great career in Catholic education. What, what do you see as the main influence? Who is it that kind of put you on this trajectory where you prepared for a career as a teacher and then from there on into being a professor and at the Institute? Are there some indiv individuals that you can point out? Well, so I have a wonderful, um, wonderful dear friend mentor um, who happens to be the first principal that I work for. Uh, her name is Kathy O'Reilly. She's the principal of St. Bridget of Kildare School in Dublin, Ohio. And um, she interviewed me as a freshly minted education student um, at the University of Dayton. And it didn't hurt that she was also Irish and had a great sense of humor. Um, <laughs> but she saw me as a person um, and she recognized um, that while the school she hired me to work in was very different from the school I had grown up attending, um, that I could bring the person I was into a very um, productive, creative, and supported professional um, career. So as a new teacher to be tapped to lead the school in technology, um, both because I was smiling in February and also because I was the only teacher in 1993 that owned a computer, um, that was a wonderful uh, creative opportunity for me. And so as a new teacher, um, the responsibility was, was matched with the honor of being trusted to lead. Um, and one of the wonderful things that schools can offer creative teachers is autonomy and trust and freedom to create and um, to respect that 
that they are able to make contributions, even at a very young age. Uh, I guess if you don't think a teacher can do those things, you might look for a different hire. Um, but it's important for teachers to have support and to feel like they have your um, attention and also um, their backs if they need it, which often in the modern era they do. But it's also really important for them to feel like they can express the freedom that really inspired, um, inspires creativity. Mm -hmm. Claire, as you were studying for your uh, doctorate degree, um, tell me some about that discernment process and you know, what, what, did you intend to go into higher ed um, as you were pursuing that degree? Were you open uh, to some other possibilities having been in kind of K-12 Catholic ed prior? Well, so I wish I could say I was um, strategic enough at that point in my life to have planned a career trajectory. Um, instead, I actually had been brought up to believe that, like Mary, you say yes to mm -hmm. opportunities. Um, when you believe that they are coming from above to help you grow, learn, and address some of the problems that you see. Uh, so I never really planned to become a college professor. Um, I just kept saying yes to okay. things. And um, it, yeah, so my opportunities to pursue a doctoral program actually emerged when I was in college and had been involved with um, some work with a professor looking at professional preparation for teachers. And I was invited to participate in a competition for teachers, analyzing a case study presenting challenges associated with teaching and learning. And I skipped my college graduation to attend it because I figured it's more fun to do something than it is to celebrate what you did. So uh, my parents were fine with that because it was a fourth of, of eight children and they had plenty more graduations to attend, but I met the people I ended up working for my doctoral program. Okay. And they also appreciated um, the, the desire I had to create things, to solve problems, to deal with messy things and try and make them better. And um, I ultimately ended up going to attend their um to attend their university and to work with them because at that stage, the technology skills that I had developed in the time I was teaching at St. James the Less had become very useful. Um, it was 1997 by that point. And at the school, I was actually leading a global awareness education project with the entire school because I'd moved from a fourth grade teacher to a technology coordinator position. And we had studied different areas of the world and how these different cultures were different, distinct, and important. And I thought it was really important to then take it the next step and show how we were actually very similar. And we were doing a project doing research with different schools around the world on what we called global values, things like loyalty, family, patriotism, um, interdependence, and each class was assigned a research project. So to do this, I had to learn to do web design and to do different kinds of high-tech things at the time, which we now are doing without any fuss at all. Um, video conferencing, which was a lot harder, less trustworthy at that stage. Um, and uh, so anyhow, those skills were very valuable because in graduate school, I worked in the very first online professional development for teachers. Uh, so, so that was a, an early kind of opportunity to think about what is possible with the design for learning when you have many opportunities to choose from. When we think about uh, design for learning, how does uh, faith play a role in terms of, of designing uh, education, do you think? So I think I would start off by saying, I think that God manifests himself as a designer. So we, of course, would never question that God is a creator and that God allows us to create, but the fact is God didn't just create for creative expression. God actually created with a plan. <laughs> um, so our, my faith helps me understand that the act of designing um, is actually something that is connected very intimately to my understanding of the world and the human person. And so I feel most human when I'm actually designing, but I recognize I have different directions that design can go in. <laughs> and when I'm designing for learning, um, I need to recognize like, what is the design? Uh, what is the divine design? And how do I order my design to facilitate the divine design? You know, I can work against the divine design and I can fragment groups of people and have them working independently because it's easier than it is to teach them to collaborate. Um, or I can build 
that divine design, which is that we're ordered as relational beings to support um, my learners interacting with each other and working beyond their um, lesser selves to grow and giving them the resources that they need to be better collaborators and therefore better co-creators with one another. So I, I hope to that, did it answer that for you? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued because I think, as you said, you can, you're, um, uh, as you program curriculum, it can go in certain directions. And the, the one thing is to make sure that there is a faith component that is integrated into the design as you move forward so that it's an informed curriculum that brings that faith right into uh, focus. Yeah, I could elaborate on that a little bit. So I kind of got it at the, you know, the 6,000 feet level. Um, I guess what I would say is that we can design for anything. Um, we can di design for discord. We can design for unity. Um, in a school, a school is designed toward the full um, development of a human person. Um, and we have to recognize that we have many different people with many different re religious identities in our schools. And so we need to take that into consideration. But when we think of a, of a school and designing a school for faith, we need to recognize that the faith is what imbues the school. The, the, our relationship with God, our understanding of the world is what animates the school. Um, and then it is also a school. And so it has things like a curriculum that needs to be imbued with our understanding of our, our Christian anthropology and our understanding of the human person. It also has things like programming that can support the Catholic kind of mission of that school or can undermine it. Um, it has also policies, things like dress codes, and it has protocols like discipline. Um, it also has people who can all, all those things can be ordered towards supporting the Catholic mission, the Catholic ethos of that school or undermining it. Um, and that's where design is helpful because we have to kind of understand these different parts to recognize how they can come together and how they might need separate but coordinated attention and energy and investment to sustain. Um, and this is where I think it's very helpful to have um, a connection to the research that's been going on in school improvement in the rest of the uh, rest of the education realm. There's a lot we've learned about a school's mission, identity, et cetera. Unfortunately, you know, other types of schools have a hard time having as cohesive a mission as a Catholic school because it is coherent, uh, right. the mission, because it presents a full understanding of reality. Um, and so we can apply some of the things we've learned in the secular world <laughs> or the world outside of Catholic education to and apply those um, I think carefully within a Catholic school to really achieve um, more success in fulfilling the mission and creating the the really faith imbued environment we would want to have in a Catholic school. Claire, related to that, uh, you're a Catholic school parent. Uh, you you um, mentioned doing some committee work uh, for the Catholic school um, uh, in South, the Catholic high school uh, in South Bend that your your daughter is currently attending. In your, from your perspective, um, what do you see as the greatest need our Catholic school teachers uh, have today? Well, besides a couple months to recover from the last 20, um, I think the most important thing that Catholic school teachers need is a recognition of their own personal um, connection to faith. Um, often when I will provide professional development for teachers that relates to the Catholic faith at an adult level, um, they will be challenged because they then have to appropriate it and communicate it to their students. And the first thing that they'll say to me is, I don't understand why I need to learn this. <laughs> and they don't recognize the importance of their own faith to their vocation of a Catholic, as a Catholic school teacher and the importance of that faith and their witness to the effective communication of the reality of the world and their and the religious belief of the school to their students. So um, there's a disconnect there. And I think that as schools uh, welcome teachers back, I think teachers need to be ministered to 
And I think that activities that really deepen a teacher's understanding of their own faith and help them to grow in that faith and recognize that personally and also professionally, that, that, that would be very valuable. It's interesting that you bring this up because um, I think one of the greatest challenges that I see is in our faculty faith formation, the ongoing uh, formation of their hearts. And too often they come and it's kind of like, I got to sit through this <clears throat> rather than actually find this as an opportunity for their hearts to um, find some healing, some hope, you know, a, a wholeness, all of those good things. Um, how would, how would you, uh, encourage teachers that this is a critical part? What are, what's a message that you would like to say to teachers to, to really encourage them in their formation? Uh, you were called. Whether you chose Catholic education as a destination or not, you're there because that's where the Lord wants you. And the Lord didn't bring you there to have you function on your own. And so if you are open to enriching and deepening your faith, you will open up wonderful opportunities to work with the Lord, to do the work you were called to do. Okay, you've just given me my retreat theme for <laughs> <laughs> the new school year coming up. I like that. You were called. Uh, that is yeah, great. Yeah, I think it would be interesting to have teachers think about that calling um, I'm actually working on a project right now that involves the development of a kit of activities for a school administrator to use um, that would equip the, the administrator to do things perhaps that they don't have time to do or they don't have the expertise to do. But one of the activities actually looks at different call stories from scripture. Um, there are many called and they come in different ways. You know, some come from, you know, pre-birth like Mary and others would be Matt like tax collectors. Um, so just taking that scriptural connection and then thinking about their own, their own calling um, and looking at how that has played out in their life and just becoming more aware of the journey that they made and the, um, the fact that they're not walking it alone. Is helpful. that something that's coming out of the McGrath Institute as a resource? Yes, it is. I'm working on it this summer and God willing, I'll have five activities done by August. Um, because I have a couple of dioceses that want to pilot for us and try those out. Um, it's very challenging as a designer to be working without actual learners to test things. So um, I'm very reliant on having people look at these ideas that, you know, we develop here at the McGrath Institute and see how they work for, um, for the rest of the world. And um, th these resources are intended to be free. And mm -hmm like many of the things that we produce here at the McGrath Institute. That's a word administrators like to hear. Right. Free. <laughs> Teachers love it even more. Yeah. Claire, as, as you think about uh, the attributes that comprise the portrait of, of the ideal Catholic high school graduate, um, what would be in that portrait for, for you? It's a great question. I was asked this by um, the principal at my daughter's school um, when we, as a Catholic Identity Committee, were trying to problematize attention to Catholic identity. Um, and I think the most important attribute of a Catholic school graduate is that they have hope. Hmm. And unlike a kind of a common understanding of hope, which might be that the future is somehow better than the past, that's actually how Battelle for Kids defines hope, uh, which is one of the measures for whether kids are developing in their SELs. At least it was at one point. Um, a, a Christian hope is an understanding that God's providence is being brought into action and that we participate in that. Um, and that we don't, have to, uh, we don't have to worry as a result of that. Um, we just have to do our part. And once we calm the worry and anxiety, we have much more energy and vitality to bring to the challenges that come to us. Um, and so I think a Catholic school graduate would be most characterized by hopefulness. And it, I think that regardless of whether a student was in a Catholic school to learn their faith or to um, receive an excellent education, because we both know that those are 
very desirable things, but not always things that teachers, that parents want for their students equally. Um, a hopeful student in an era when many students are um, despairing and paralyzed with activity because they don't know how to live and act in the world. I think that hopefulness would be a very appealing um, characteristic to market. Another characteristic I think, and I would just add one more, um, is that a student graduating from a Catholic school would have a sense of who they are as a person and have a sense of the importance of finding their vocation and actually finding their fulfillment in relationships with other people and have the virtues developed um, and the capacities to continue developing those virtues to be able to sustain a, a beautiful life. You know, uh, Claire, you said uh, just a little bit ago, you referred to kind of what we've just been coming out of in terms of our pandemic and everything. And uh, I'm guessing that there's no doubt in your mind that probably the last 14 to 15 months have been probably the most challenging and unique times for all of us uh, in our various careers. Uh, we faced not only the pandemic, we have racial tension, uh, we, have, we had a hotly contested national election that uh, polarized our nation and all that. What, in, during that whole time, what was the impact on you? What was your adjustment uh, as a leader, as a designer uh, with the McGrath Institute? What, what, what kind of an impact did that have on you? Well, so it was a great time to have a lot of um, resources to be able to share with other people and to be able to empower them um, to, to be, uh, as, as someone has referred to, a force multiplier, which is a military terminology, just meaning right. basically that you're supporting other people by offering um, what you have. Um, it, was a, it was a wonderful time because um, it, allowed, it allowed us, I think, to discover what was most important and what was most essential and to make decisions to continue doing that. Um, I did a lot in the very early days of the pandemic trying to help schools recognize what they were so that they could then intentionally recreate those virtually and even put together a, a functional worksheet to identify the attributes of a Catholic school and to stimulate administrators as they thought through what needed to be reconstructed. Um, so that was a beautiful opportunity um, of working with administrators, specifically in the Diocese of Columbus, where I still have very close ties. Uh, and I think it was great for them because we, we based that reconstruction of the school on the document the Catholic School and pulled out the most important aspects. And those were things that had been in the school that they had become so much a part of the, the scenery that and, and so taken for granted that this was a wonderful opportunity to examine how to bring those forward. And it'll be exciting to see how they bring those lessons forward into the future as they continue to evolve their Catholic schools. Um, for me personally, it was an opportunity to really discover the gifts of a crisis, um, like I said, which not only helps you be more intentional about what a school is, but also uh, more intentional about of, about what a school does. And I think during this particular time, Catholic schools have really conversed with the larger society in a way that they, they don't typically think they are. Um, they don't necessarily con converse actively um, by intentionally going out and saying, hey, look at us, we're Catholic schools and this is what education can and should be. Um, they were really focused on being the best they could and the light and energy they were generating their schools, I think shown out and challenged the entire education ecology um, and ecosystem to be better. And so I think, um, you know, as I think about just Kathy O'Reilly's school in Dublin, you know, they managed to be in person and they ministered, managed not only to be in person, but to minister to a variety of, um, of people in their community, both in their parish and outside. They were able to continue to um, reach out to the shut-ins in their community through the school. And they were able to continue to care for one another because they were able to be together. And while not all students chose to come back in person, those students were still able to be um, included. And I just think that sets up a model that really challenges the larger culture to think about what the mission of a school is and how to manage that in a way that really is most caring, most supportive, and most um, needed at particular crisis moments. 
it's interesting that the pandemic for us, and I know this is true of a lot of Catholic schools, uh, brought an influx from the public school sector because we were in session and they were not, and a lot of the students were not doing well in, in virtual learning. Uh, we did have options for those that, that did not feel safe in returning to the classroom. But um, when you have uh, an influx of those from the uh, public schools that are now a part of, of your Catholic school, what do you think are some uh, things that you can do to help uh, retention, that it isn't just uh, an, you know, an island of escape until the, the storm is over and then you go back where you were, but uh, to keep them uh, in uh, the school where they have chosen to come. Do you have any ideas on that? I do. So I think one of the main reasons people come to Catholic schools is because they want their children to be known and cared for, and they want their children to be part of a community. Um, you know, there are Vatican documents that point out that the parents are first teacher and the family is primary of primary importance, but it's an insufficient society. It is in, in a, unable in, it, in its own right to build a full human person. Um, children need to be connected to others. And, you know, we all know the phrase takes a village, right? And so I think parents recognized, especially during a, a challenging time for the children and for themselves, that they really wanted their children to be connected to a network and a community. And so I think really emphasizing the community aspects of the school is important, but at the same time, it's really necessary. And I found this through my own personal experiences to challenge the insular community that may have many children and know each other, or maybe the second generation of families that have been participating in the school. They need to welcome everyone to that community. Um, we all know that there are parents who are not in the in crowd. Um, there are parents who have second shift jobs and can't you know, participate in quite the way they normally would, or maybe they're caretaking for an infirm family member, or maybe their life is just too challenging to be able to um, reach beyond themselves and try to connect with the, the school community. But I, I really think making intentional efforts to welcome those people, to assign them mentors, to have parent coffees and teas, to do needs assessments, to find out when those would be most appropriate, um, to figure out how to make sure that those kids are adjusting to the school, check with them, see how their year went, ask them if they plan to come back, welcome them back, make sure that some somebody has welcomed them and said, we really thought it was great to have you to join us this year. What can we do to continue to keep you in our school? And what can we learn from your experiences that will help us be a better, more welcoming and more inclusive school? Um, it's so challenging to, to create a community. You know, it's much easier to just let it materialize and then to maybe not look at it too closely. But I think in the pandemic, we discovered that there were people who were on the outside of the community. And I know I wrote, I wrote a blog for the National Catholic Education Association just about the holes in communication that were visible during the pandemic because people couldn't rely on conversations they had in the parking lot right? They, they had to have information shared and there was more information to share. And so schools, many of them found that they had these giant gaps that they needed to fill with processes for making sure people knew what was going on. But those communications gaps always occur for people who aren't on the in, in track at that school. Um, and so I think if we really want to be a Catholic school, we need to not only create a school culture in the school, but recognize that that culture um, is, is valuable to the families. Um, and that culture is necessary for the full education of that child as a person. Um, and only some of those educational experiences happen during the course of the school day or through extracurricular activities. They also happen through the relationships that those kids have and the relationships that parents and families have. So I think if a school can um, address those, then it's going to really welcome people. And I think people will see the value added of a Catholic education beyond uh, getting kids into college or on the right tra career trajectory. Claire, uh, you mentioned hope being uh, this attribute um, that that really frames uh, the portrait of the ideal Catholic school graduate. I love that image. Uh, but the data and demographics right now around religion as a whole, our American Catholic Church, are not very hope inspiring. Um, you know, we, we saw a Gallup poll uh, a month plus ago now where for the first time in the history of our country, 
uh, church membership has across all denominations has has dipped below 50 percent. Um, you know, in the Catholic Church, since the year 2000, you look at a lot of uh, sacramental metrics that just on a landslide, um, you know, what words of advice, counsel would you have for Catholic school leaders or those discerning a vocation in the church right now, um, given this, this current situation? One of the things that I think is important for leaders to know is that the people that most need you are the ones that are the least like you. Uh, so Catholic school teachers and leaders tend to have stronger faith. They tend to already possess mm -hmm. a Catholic worldview, a sense that reality is not purely material and temporal, um, but they don't recognize that the people who are falling through the cracks and disaffiliating don't have that. Uh, there's many studies that have been done on disaffiliation. Uh, Christian Smith here at the University of Notre Dame has done a beautiful one. He's also done a follow-up on Catholic parenting. Um, and we also have an initiative within our institute that looks at religion and science and the complementarity of religion science. And the impetus for that initiative was really looking at some of the challenges of a modern age and the challenges of faith in a modern age. So we're in an age of skepticism where we question things. We're also in an age of positivism where we tend to pay attention to the things that we see versus the things that we can't see. Um, and we're also in an age of materialism and empiricism, which is, you know, philosophical terms, but basically they emphasize ways of knowing that are scientific. And this is the reality that today's students and in fact parents are growing up in. And it's not enough to just teach the Catholic faith. We actually have to address the misconceptions people have about the faith. And we have to address the status of the students and the families that Catholic schools are ministering to. So it's not enough to, to witness and to teach the faith that also has to be moderated and situated in a way that addresses where a person is right now. Um, so part of the disaffiliation happening from the liturgy is that people never really understood the true presence. Right. The real presence, sorry, real presence. And so what we're seeing, I think, is that education is the answer. <laughs> And that's a very exciting thing for me, being in education, because I have 20 years of learning how to do really good teaching in non-Catholic environments. And those things can be brought to bear in teaching about our faith. I think that people who are repelled by things in the church and people who are pulled away by society don't have enough of the faith to hold on to. And I think if we could educate them better, and there's lots we can do to do that, um, then those forces won't have as much power. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up. Uh, I remember in my own upbringing, uh, of course, I'm a convert and I came uh, out of uh, Anglicanism and growing up as an Episcopalian, uh, one of the things I found is I was never told the why behind the what. Why do you do what you do in the liturgy? And when you learn these things, all of a sudden, you can embrace it and make it your own. It's not just something that you do, but it is something that you participate in. Father Randy, that's a powerful observation. And it's one that I've shared. I actually use an anecdote. I'll talk about my old neighborhood in Columbus had this beautiful pond. And unfortunately, there were all these messy waterfowl and people kept feeding them. So they kept coming back. And there was a sign that said, don't feed the ducks. And um, it didn't work. Eventually they replaced it with a more sophisticated sign that said, please don't feed the waterfowl. It causes mess. <laughs> it is unhealthy. It is not good for the waterfowl. It makes them sick and aggressive. Uh -huh. And what that sign did was work because uh -huh. it addressed a need to know that the modern person has. Mm -hmm. We need to understand why something needs to be done. And so I think one of the transitions between the 20th and the 21st century in our process approaches to, to teaching the faith is it was enough in, in, enough because there were other structures to keep people connected to the faith, like culture, media, et cetera, to just teach moral ways of living, right? Without necessarily intentionally teaching the worldview, the sense of reality 
that helps us understand why the moral guidance of the church has meaning. And mm -hmm. so I think it's really important to teach the deep underlying assumptions that give the moral life meaning, right? The purpose of reality, the, um, what it means to be a human person, um, what dignity means and why human beings have it, um, and how we should be functioning in the reality that we uh, experience. And I think if we teach those underlying assumptions rather than just teaching the superficial things will be much more powerful, uh, but that's much harder. <laughs> and yet we have an advantage because it is reality and it, there is something within the human person divinely um, implanted to recognize reality. If we can scrape away the calcification of 21st century living and open up ourselves to be sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That was, that's really rich. And, uh, you know, Kyle, I'm sitting here thinking we've got to have her back. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I could keep going for a long time. I want to ask questions about what does a designer say to teachers who are trying to adjust to a block curriculum and things like that, a block schedule. And uh, so, Claire, could we uh, maybe schedule another time to have you back and maybe we can dive into some nuts and bolts with you? Sure, I would absolutely love that. As you can tell, this is a topic I'm so passionate about, and I just feel it's a gift to be able to have that conversation and to connect with other people who are helping um, to address some of the same problems. Wonderful. Well, we're going to do that, and, and I'll get in touch with you because I think that uh, I know I'm going to listen to this podcast several times just to, uh, again, capture a lot of the stuff. This has really been rich. Well, and, thank uh, you. Yeah, Kyle, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I echo that sentiment, Father Randy. I want to thank Claire uh, for your time today and being uh, our guest on Follow to Lead. And is there a title uh, uh, for your resource that's coming out in late summer, uh, August timeframe? Yeah, great, great question. I think right now the working title is the Catholic School Administrator's Catholic Identity Activity Kit. Uh, if okay. anyone has suggestions for something better, I'm all for it. Um, but okay. I think functional titles let people know what things are, but it would be delightful to be able to support the work of, of the valiant leaders of Catholic education, especially in the modern era. Uh, is That's great. Yeah. As an administrator, I think of that kid and I go, that's my lifesaver. <laughs> so anyway, well, thank you so much, Claire. We really appreciate you uh, being with us today. And uh, for those who would like to know more about the McGrath Institute, they can uh, go to the web at? At http colon slash slash mcgrath.nd.edu. And you'll find all kinds of resources there that they can download and use within their um, personal experience of faith and their ministry work in schools. And they can also find out other information about what we do and opportunities to partner with us. So we'd be Great. excited and for them to do that. Yeah. And I'll put that, uh, that link in our show notes too, so that people can just jump right to that. So Dr. Claire Kilbane, thank you so much for being with us today on Follow to Lead. And for our viewers and our listeners, uh, if you haven't already done so, please be sure to subscribe and leave a comment or uh, to encourage us in our future programming. We also want to thank our production interns, John Sampson and Alex Shire, for uh, the production of this particular podcast, and also our production supervisor, Mr. Jack Alsbach. And so may Almighty God bless you. We'd like to thank you for joining us on this episode of Follow to Lead, a production of the Duke and Altum Schools Collaborative. To learn more about finding your own path in your journey of faith, or for more information on what we discussed in today's episode, you are invited to follow us on social media and visit us on the web at diaschools.org. To provide a one-time donation or monthly pledge, please visit our website. Your gift will aid us in providing up-to-date information, additional resources, and other support on how to take Catholic education to a higher level. We look forward to helping you follow God's call to lead others to God right here on Follow to Lead.